Christmas greetings to Father Jerry and the people of Holy Comforter Parish in Tallahassee, Florida. I am both honored and humbled to be part of your virtual walk through Advent and Christmas. Christmas greetings to the folks at St. George's Parish in London, a parish that I have journeyed with for the last 18 months as they look for a new priest to lead them into the future God has in mind for them. And Christmas greetings to those who are watching this video in other parts of the United States, in other parts of Canada, and indeed around the world. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Over the past four weeks, hope and peace and joy and love have been the focus of the preaching and, and the teaching of the church. They have been our signposts as we journey through Advent. And I, I have to tell you, I, I don't know about you, but I cannot remember a time when I needed Advent more. I cannot remember a time when the gifts of hope and joy and peace and love were as important for the spiritual and emotional health of the planet. I cannot remember a time when as we approach Christmas, I felt such a desperate need for the light that would shine in the darkness. Yeah, we needed Advent this year and we need Christmas this year. Now it is my task to take us to Bethlehem and to spend some time focusing on the Christ, focusing on God's gift of love. But first, let's pray. God of majesty and mercy, you are powerful, you are holy, and you are loving. You come among us not as a warrior or a tyrant, but as a child. New life born among us and for us. And so we come to worship you this day, trusting your wisdom with Joseph, pondering your mystery with Mary. We offer you our love for all that you have been for all that you are and for all that you will be, one God, holy and loving, now and forever. Amen. Christmas, and in particular, the birth narrative, have become so much a part of our culture, so much a part of a nostalgic, sentimental season, that I think in many ways, the birth narrative has been sentimentalized and sanitized. And I think for us to really feel the power of what this narrative is about, we need to connect some dots first. So I wanna start by taking a look at a reading that we had a couple of weeks ago from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 61 verses one to four, listen, listen again to these words. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. The first line of that reading sets the tone. Listen to it again. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. The spirit, the ruach, the holy breath 
of God, the same holy breath that breathed over chaos and, and created the cosmos, the same holy breath that breathed over the Red Sea and parted the waters so the people of Israel could escape from Egypt, that same holy breath breathed over Isaiah to empower him, to anoint him, to ordain him for his unique ministry. And his unique ministry was to bring good news, to bring gospel, to bring holy gospel, Yahweh's good news for a people who were desperately, desperately in need of hearing some. And listen to what that good news was. It was about Yahweh being present and active in, in their world. And as a result, as, as Yahweh's agent, Isaiah was, seen, was being sent to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty, to comfort, to provide for. These are all powerful, powerful action verbs that when you put them all together, what they talk about it is restoration. Restoration of a people who were oppressed and depressed restoration of a people so that those who were living on the margins could begin to live life with a sense of dignity, with purpose, with hope, and with joy. It was Yahweh's good news for a broken world that it was going to be fixed. The world was about to be stood on its head. And, and the response, the reaction for Yahweh's people was that they would build up, they would raise up, they would repair and heal God's broken world. This is good news. This is gospel. This is holy gospel. Now listen, what I'd like you to do is to push your pause button. And, and if you're alone, just think about this question for a minute. If you're with someone, Take some time to talk about it. Two questions. The first one, are there ways in which we can identify somewhat with those who had returned from exile in Babylon? And the second question, what might the Spirit be saying to us, to you and to me, in our own unique context, right here and right now? Think about that for just a few moments. I want to move us from Isaiah to Luke's gospel, chapter one, verses 39 to 56. Listen to these words. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. 
He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her for about three months and then returned to her home. The world into which Jesus was going to be born was a world of violence and oppression under the excesses of the domination culture that was Rome. Life was so difficult for the people that even though they were living in their own country, it was for them as if the time of exile in Babylon had never ended. And so they longed for, they prayed for God to be present to them once again. They longed for, they prayed for God to be active once again. They, they longed for, they prayed for another exodus. They longed for, they prayed for freedom and justice and peace for themselves and for their children and for their children's children. In this passage that we have just read, the spotlight, if you will, shines on those verses which have come to be known as the Magnificat or the Song of Mary. From our childhood, those of us who are Anglicans, Episcopalians, we have sung or said this hymn in liturgies, Rarely, I suspect, for most of us really thinking about the power and the meaning of the words. Listen, listen to what N.T. Wright has to say. Tom Wright says this, It is the gospel before the gospel. A fierce, bright shout of triumph 30 weeks before Bethlehem and 30 years before Calvary and Easter. Mary and Elizabeth shared a dream. It was the ancient dream of Israel, the dream that one day all that the prophets had said would come true, that one day Israel's God would do what he had said to Israel's earliest ancestors, that all nations would be blessed through Abraham's family. But for that to happen, the powers that kept the world in slavery had to be toppled. God would have to win a victory over the bullies, the power brokers, the forces of evil, which people like Mary and Elizabeth knew all too well. Mary and Elizabeth, like so many Jews of their time, searched the scriptures, soaked themselves in the Psalms and prophetic writings, which spoke of mercy, hope, fulfillment, reversal, and revolution, victory over evil, and of God coming to the rescue at last. Our liturgical use of this Song of Mary, especially when we sing it in Latin, has made it sound like an act of piety for a teenage girl. But if we look at the words, if we consider the context, these words are bold, they are powerful, they are courageous. This Mary is, is no shrinking violet. She's no demure young woman. At this point, I, I believe Mary becomes a powerful and powerfully important prophetic voice. Listen again. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones. He has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. This is good news. This is gospel. This is holy gospel. This is Yahweh's good news to a people who desperately needed to hear it, then and now. Okay, 
what I'd like you to do is think about a few questions. Putting this passage alongside the passage from Isaiah 61. What's going on here? How does the gospel, the good news proclaimed in Mary's song, echo the good news, the gospel proclaimed in Isaiah? And how do the words of Mary inform the readers of Luke's gospel, us, of just what exactly is going on here? If you'd push pause and take some time thinking about those questions. Welcome back. Want to move you a little bit further in Luke's gospel. Listen to these words from chapter one, verses 67 to 79. John's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit. Once again, we hear Holy Spirit, Ruach, the holy breath of God. John's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke this prophecy. Blessed be the Lord, Israel's God. He has come to his people and brought them their freedom. He's raised up a horn of salvation for us in David's house, the house of his servant. Just as he promised through the mouths of the prophets, the holy ones speaking from the ages of old, salvation from our enemies, rescue from hatred, mercy to our ancestors, keeping his holy covenant. He swore an oath to Abraham, our father, to give us deliverance from enemy hands so we might worship him, holy and righteous before his face to the end of our days. And you, child, you will be called the prophet of the highest one, Go ahead of the Lord, preparing his way, letting his people know of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. The heart of our God is full of mercy. That's why his daylight has dawned from on high, bringing light to the dark as we sat in death's shadow, guiding our feet into the path of peace. Where Mary's song the Magnificat, was about a great reversal where the rich would be brought down and the poor would be lifted up, where the, the social structure of society was going to be reversed. What we see in, in this song from Zechariah is an allusion to the transformation of the world. The Benedictus, as we have come to call it, proclaims the coming of Jesus as the fulfillment of God's promises for the transformation of the world. And Zechariah blesses God and praises God for his faithfulness and mercy, who has intervened as they, as they lived with the fear of suffering and death and became a light which for them was the light of hope shining in the darkness of their world. This points unmistakably to the reality that the child of Bethlehem, that this Jesus was to be born to be the savior of the world. In this child who was to be born in Bethlehem, God would be present and active. Everything, everything was about to change because whenever God is present and active, nothing looks the same. Listen to the words of John Dominic Crossan. Crossan says the Magnificat and the Benedictus and indeed the Christmas stories combine what we often separate, namely religion and politics, spirituality and a passion for the world. Are, are these hymns, are they religious and spiritual hymns? Yes, they are. 
Are they also political about a transformed world? Yes, they are. Crossan goes on to say, together they announce that the great divine cleanup of the world has begun in Jesus. In Jesus, God is about to set things right. Okay, question for you to think about. This time of year, our thoughts about the birth of Jesus are strongly affected, whether we want to admit it or not, by stained glass windows and Hallmark card images of the nativity. How do these songs from Mary and from Zechariah inform and perhaps change our sentimental nostalgic picture of what happened in the birth of the Christ child? Push pause and, and think about that question for just a moment. Okay, it is time for us to go to Bethlehem. The dots, I hope, have been connected. It's time to see where this takes us. And so we listen to these words from the second chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. And I'm reading this from N.T. Wright's Kingdom New Testament translation. Uh, it's not authorized for use in worship in Canada, but I love it. Listen to these words. At that time, a decree was issued by Augustus Caesar. The whole world was to be registered. This was the first registration before the one when Quirinius was governor of Syria. So everyone set off to be registered each to their own town. Joseph, too, who belonged to the house and the family of David, went from Nazareth in Galilee to Bethlehem in Judea, David's city, to be registered with his fiancée Mary, who was pregnant. So that's where they were when the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to a son, her firstborn. She wrapped him up and put him to rest in a feeding trough because there was no room for them in the normal living quarters. There were shepherds in that region, out in the open, keeping a night watch around their flock. And an angel of the Lord stood in front of them. The glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Don't be afraid, the angel said to them. Look, I've, I've got good news for you. News that will make everybody very happy. Today, a savior has been born for you, the Messiah, the Lord in David's town. And this will be the sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped up and lying in a feeding trough. And suddenly with the angel, there was a crowd of the heavenly armies and they were praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and peace on earth among those in his favor. So when the angels had gone away again into heaven, the shepherds said to each other, well then, let's go to Bethlehem and see what it's all about, all this that the Lord has told us. So they hurried off and they found Mary, Joseph, and the child lying in the feeding trough. And when they saw it, they told them what had been said to them about this child. And all the people who heard it were amazed at the things that the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all these things and mused over them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying God for all that they had heard and all that they had seen as it had been told to them. 
I'd like you to take just a couple of minutes to think about what images or memories or feelings are stirred up for you by this passage. Hit pause for a moment. As challenging as it may be for us to understand the power of this story, we have to move in our minds beyond nativity scenes in parks and Christmas pageants in churches and all the lovely memories that we have of Christmas's past. The nostalgia of this season, it just has a way of blinding us to what's really going on here. A census had been called for by Caesar. Now, in, in our Western world, when a census takes place, it can be a short form or a long form, but basically what it begins to get at is how many people are living in a particular residence, what is their age, what is their employment, and whether the census is a long form or a short form, at the end of the day, its purpose is to get information for the government. The thought being, I guess, that the more information the government has, the better job they can do in governing us. Whether that's true or not, I have no idea, but I think that's the purpose of the census. But not so, not so in Jesus' day, not so in Caesar's time. In Caesar's time, the purpose of a census was to prop up the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And, and the Pax Romana was about control, control over the world, economic, political, and military control. And for that Pax Romana to be maintained, it took money. It took money to support the military machine that powered and maintain Rome. And that's the purpose of the census. All those who came to be registered were about to become tax-paying, bona fide subjects of Caesar. Okay, we move on from that to the announcement, the announcement of the birth of this child. And the announcement came not, not to priests, not to kings, because they were part of the group that were compromised. Rather, this announcement came to shepherds. Shepherds who were folk who lived on the margins. Shepherds, people who in the social strata of Judea, were as low as low could be, trust me, you would not be inviting them to any of your Christmas cocktail parties. But these shepherds, these shepherds, those on the margins, they were precisely the people that Jesus came to set free. And I think it's fascinating that when we listen to this story, when we listen to this story in Tom Wright's translation, we hear that these shepherds were confronted not by the hosts of heaven, but by the armies of heaven, which is in fact a better translation. And what this says to us is that what we are beginning to anticipate with the birth of this child is a clash between kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Caesar. Tom Wright puts it this way. He says, Augustus, people said, was the savior of the world. Caesar, it was said, was its king, its lord, and increasingly in the eastern part of his empire, people were worshiping Caesar as a god. Meanwhile, far away on that same eastern frontier, 
a child was born who would within a generation be hailed as the son of God, whose followers would speak of him as savior and Lord, whose arrival they thought was about to bring justice and peace to the world. The birth of this infant is indeed the beginning of a confrontation between the kingdom of God in all of its apparent weakness, insignificance and vulnerability in the kingdoms of the world. So what does all this mean? I think it means that in the gentle cooing of this tiny infant, if we listen closely, very, very closely, we just may hear the Holy Spirit, the Ruach, the breath of God, whispering to us that this is God's world, not Caesar's. That was good news. That was gospel. That was holy gospel then and today. Okay, let's let's finish up by going back to the future. And I want to take you to Luke chapter 4 verses 16 to 21. You know these words. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and he unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And then he began to say to them, today, this scripture, has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Spirit of God, the Ruach, the Holy Breath of God lived in him, anointed him, ordained him, prepared him, strengthened him for the ministry that he had in him, God would be present to us and for us. In him, the promises of the prophets were about to be realized. In him, the great reversal was about to take place. In him, in him, something extraordinarily dramatic, what was about to happen. And, and this, is, this is good news. This gospel, this holy gospel. What we're hearing at this point, I believe, is a statement that the kingdom of God the kingdom of God was breaking in. The kingdom train had pulled into the station and it was time for people to get on board and buckle up because the world as they knew it was about to be stood on its head. Okay, one last set of questions for you. So what is the Spirit whispering in your heart through these words of Scripture? How is this holy child 
and the man he grew to be the source and the assurance of God's gifts of hope and peace and joy and love. And, and finally, what action might this be calling you, us, what action might it be calling us to right here and right now? Push pause and think about that for a moment, if you will. It has been, as I said before, both an honor and a humbling experience to be with you for this study, to be with you to help to draw your Advent journey to a close. I pray that all that you have heard over the last month about hope, peace, joy, and love will give you the strength and the encouragement that you, we, all of us need to enter into the next year and continue to confront all of the things that have challenged us and frightened us for the past 12 months. Let's close with a prayer. Let us pray. God of the starry heavens, and this good old earth, eternal God, God with us. You have come among us in the figure of a baby, a newborn reaching out to us to bring a smile to our lips and hope to our hearts. Thank you for your tenderness with which you touch our lives. This Christmas, as we remember the baby lying in a manger, we pray for peace. Peace in all the places where there is anger or war or fear. Peace in all the hearts that know sorrow or stress. We pray for people who will not sleep safely tonight because of conflict in their lives. Cradle all these people and places in your love so the world may sleep in heavenly peace this night. This Christmas, as we remember the Mother Mary rocking her baby, we pray for all children born this Christmas season. Watch over mothers and fathers and grandparents hoping for the best for their newborns. Help us to create communities where every child, every child is valued and every family has enough. May families rejoice because Christ the Savior is born for us, for each of us and for all of us. This Christmas, as we remember the Father Joseph protecting his little one, we pray for all those watching over the helpless and the hopeless this season. Be with all those who must work this holiday to keep the world safe and to care for those in need. Be with those who are sick, or sad, or lonely, so that each one will know your tender touch. This Christmas, we remember the shepherds coming in haste and the wise men coming in wonder. Open our hearts to reach out to the Christ child, to receive the gift you offer us in Jesus, even as we offer our love to you in his name. Bless us in the year ahead so that we can share your love with all the lives that touch ours.
May our hearts sing with the Christmas angels, glory to you, O God, and on earth, peace for all who wonder at your love. Amen.